and Ar Arthur. His name's not Arthur. And maybe this is just the universe saying, do it again, you can do better. And that's what we're gonna try and do today. And then the last of the new to me, that's not true. <laughs> and somehow, somewhere, after three years on YouTube, I still cannot <laughs> look. Hi everybody, it's Audrey and welcome back to Chapter and Converse and welcome to part two of everything I read in 2021. So if you missed part one, I will link it down below. But like I said, I'm breaking this up into multiple videos because I don't want it to be crazy long, but also it just makes more sense and lets me talk more about the books because I can't just be succinct. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about what we're doing here because you already know. Let's get into part two. So I do have a couple books that follow the power of female friendship and relationships. So not necessarily the dark and messed upness of it, but the power of female support, of having great friends and family by your side. So it's not all doom and gloom here, my friends. And now we're gonna talk about that Taylor Jenkins read. So this is After I Do. This is her second book. And at the time, this was the only book of hers I hadn't read yet. So this is, I read this before Malibu Rising came out and I was kind of savoring it because I didn't want to just be without a Taylor Jenkins read book to read. And I was in the worst reading slump and I didn't know how to get out of it. And I was talking to my friends and it was actually Sarah from Sarah's Nightstand. And she was like, maybe try a book from an author that you know you love, or maybe try like a book in a series so you can get back in with certain characters. And I was like, that's a really good idea because nothing was hitting for me. So I picked this up and no surprise, I loved it. Again, I said it when I was talking about Malibu Rising. She can do no wrong. And also, I also reread Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo this year on audiobook, which was also great. But let's talk about this book. So this book follows a very unconventional decision that our main characters make. So Lauren and Ryan have been married for, I want to say, like 10 years. And they sort of reached a breaking point in their relationship. They might have been married 10 years or they've been together for 10 years. But they've been in it for a long time. And they decide to take one year off from each other. So they're staying married, but they both go to live their lives. They're not gonna talk. They're gonna do anything and everything they wanna do with the hope at the end of this is they're either gonna find their way back to each other or they're going to find out that they're not meant to be together and they're gonna end it for good. So we follow Lauren on the journey of this year and it's so well done. I love how Taylor Jenkins Reid just takes these stories and takes such an unconventional turn on them. And we get to see the pain and the heartbreak and we get to see the successes and the happiness and the dynamic how it changes for her having been with Ryan for so long and we see her through all the holidays and being with her family and how weird it is to not have her husband by her side but she also feels a certain sense of freedom and liberation about being on her own and the female relationships in this between her best friend and her sister and her mom I just loved the dynamic between all of these different characters and how they are there for her and how they support her decision to do this and how we see her transform over the course of this year and everything that she learns and we get to see some flashbacks about how her and Ryan met so we get to understand their whole relationship and I just loved it so very much. So many quotable lines, so many dog-eared pages. I cried buckets, you guys. I just love what she does all the time. And there's just so many beautiful passages in this. I wish I had underlined some stuff so I could quote it for you guys. But it's about moving forward and what does that mean? And I just saw that I underlined something. So let's see if it's worth reading here. <laughs> so I underlined a line that says, unconditional love is the freedom to follow your heart and still have a home. If your family won't tell you the truth, who will? Be the daughter your mother needs. Be the daughter who does ugly stuff for the right reasons. That's where the deep, beautiful, mystifying love of family truly kicks in. So I just thought there were so many great parts to this book. And it's so much more than her love story with Ryan. But that love story within family and friends. And that's really what I think took it to a whole other level for me. Brilliant. Another story with amazing female characters and nothing like Taylor Jenkins Reid is Simone St. James, The Sundown Motel. 
This is my first Simone St. James. This is also a five-star prediction for me. And unlike Riley Sagerville, there is no is it, isn't it kind of dancing a line. We know out of the gate, this is a ghost story. And it was creepy and it was atmospheric. And it was one of those books where I was reading it at night and I was like, this is fine. And then I'd flip a page and I'm like, this is terrifying. So maybe read it by the light of day, unless you're a little bit less of a scaredy cat. But I loved the writing in this. We have dual timelines. We have just powerful, strong, amazing female main characters throughout this book that I loved. So this one, we've got Upstate New York in 1982 and then again in 2017. So in 1982, we have a woman named Viv and she wants to move to New York City, but she doesn't have the money. So she winds up working at the Sundown Motel to make some money. And then she winds up disappearing. So then in present day, which is 2017, we have a girl named Carly and her mom has just passed away and her mom was Viv's sister. And Carly has never been able to let go of the story of her aunt Viv and what happened to her. And now that Carly's mom has passed away, she's feeling very lost and she's feeling very untethered. So she decides to go back to New York and try and find out what happened to her aunt. And she winds up working at the Sundown Motel in the exact same job that Viv had in the exact same town and all sorts of weird things start to happen. I loved this book, you guys, so, so much. Like I said, it's creepy, it's atmospheric, it's got all the things. There's a little bit of police investigation, there's a little, bit, a little bit of amateur detectiveness going on in here, and it really exceeded my expectations. It's haunting, it's chilling, it's like all of those things, and I can't wait to read more of her books. I have The Broken Girls, she has a new book coming out in a couple of months, and it definitely secured my place as a fan of Simone St. James. And then the last book in the female friendships are amazing category is Finley Donovan is Killing It by El Casamano. I also, let's low key call it an honorable mention, Finley Donovan Knocks Him Dead because I was able to get an arc of this and read it already. That comes out February 1st. I've already pre-ordered mine. Let me just sidebar for you guys for half a second. I did my pre-order through Murder by the Book. She's doing personalized copies, not sponsored, but if you guys are interested, I'll link that stuff down below. I think you have to like mid January to be able to qualify for the personalization, or you might just be able to buy an autographed one if you're interested. But I loved this book so much. And this is Finley and Vero are definitely like the best friends that I want to have. So this is the Dead to Me vibes, the Linda Cardellini, Christina Applegate relationship. It has that same vibe of like that dark humor but there's also some mystery and levity to it at times, but it's also a woman who is struggling. There's grief, there's loss. There's the great dynamic between the sisters and her and Vera who are good friends now. So this book is about a woman named Finley. She is a struggling writer. She is the mom of two young children and her husband has left her for their realtor, but he moved down the street. He's such a charming guy and he lives there with the realtor. So that way he can be close to the kids. So when the book opens, Finley is at a Panera talking to her agent because she has not completed the manuscript for her new book and she's really struggling and she writes mystery books. So she's talking to her agent about her story and a woman at a nearby table mistakes her for a hit woman and hires Finley to murder her husband. So Finley, who is trying to explain that's not what I do, but at the same time could really desperately use the money because she's so past due on all of her bills, finds herself in this mistaken identity mixed up mess and has to find her way out of it. So Vero had been her nanny, which again, charming husband had fired, but Finley rehires and the two of them together are sort of like, I feel like if Ethel and Lucy were solving crimes with a lot of darkness over <laughs> the humor of it all, this could be the book. I love it so much. And in book number two, which I will not talk much about because I don't want to give anything away because it's a sequel, it was, more of the same. It's on brand. It's what I expected. I enjoyed the story. It's a whole new mystery. We get more of the same characters. We also get an expanded cast of characters. And I love getting to know these characters even more. So highly recommend them both. And if you have not yet read the first one, you have a little time before book number two comes out, but definitely on my most anticipated list for next year, because duh, I already bought it. Let's talk about another book series. So I read, I reread The Inheritance Game this year to prepare for The Hawthorne Legacy. I originally read this in 2021, no, 2020, 
duh. And it was one of my favorite books of the year. So Hawthorne Legacy is book number two in this series. It's a YA mystery series, I would call it, rather than thriller. And it's it's puzzles and mysteries and it's the creepy mansion and secret passageways and family secrets and lots of history. And I love everything about this series. This is totally on brand for Jennifer Lynn Barnes. I started her natural series. I have the rest of the books in the series, so I need to finish it. I read her debutante series, which I very much enjoyed. And I love just her writing and her characters, the relationships, the stories of it all. But I am always, of course, trash for a mystery. So book number one is about a girl named Avery and she is living a very kind of quiet life in Pennsylvania. She lives with her half sister. Avery's mom has passed away. They share a father who was walked out on them years ago. And they're basically just kind of like keeping it together and scraping by and like Avery sleeps in her car a lot of the time. And then Avery gets a visit from a man who is a lawyer down in Texas and he tells her that she has been named in the will of this bazillionaire who has passed away. But Avery doesn't know who this guy is. So her and her sister wind up going down there and she finds out that she has inherited, I read this every time, $46.2 billion. And part of the deal in order to inherit Tobias Hawthorne's fortune is she needs to live in his house, which is basically like a secure compound, with his adult children, who didn't get too much in the inheritance, and then his four grandchildren, grandsons. And she has to stay there for a year. So book number one is her really trying to find out why her, and also people are fighting against her, people are questioning why she was left the money and are basically trying to, you know, challenge the will, and in many ways challenge her, and her life becomes kind of at risk. So this is trying to figure out the what's what, and then there's more of the what's what in book number two. And book number three, which I believe is gonna be the final in the trilogy, is coming out in 2022, which I'm very excited about. But I totally enjoyed these books. The audiobook is great. So I did wind up reading and doing the audio of Inheritance, and I only read Hawthorne Legacy. And I really just enjoyed it. I like the dynamics between the characters. This has that knives out feel to it. And it was just, again, so well done, totally enjoyable, and I highly recommend them both. Another book that I did not see coming this year is Cackle by Rachel Harrison. And I was very excited about this book. I definitely had a curiosity about it after I had heard about it on a podcast. And it was about this woman who was living in New York with her boyfriend and they broke up and she could no longer afford to live there. She's a teacher. She's been sleeping on the couch since like, I think they've been broken up for like three months or something. And she winds up getting a teaching job in upstate New York and she goes up there and it's sort of this very stars hollowy kind of Gilmore Girls town. And she's a little fish out of water, but she winds up meeting this woman, Sophie. I wanna say Sophie, not Sophia. Yes, she meets a woman named Sophie at kind of like a farmer's market in town. And she's instantly intrigued by this woman. And this woman instantly brings her under her wing. Did I tell you our main character's name? I didn't, Annie. So Sophia instantly brings Annie under her wing and wants to help her because Annie is super hung up on her ex and she's having a very hard time letting him go. And Sophie wants to teach her how to be an independent, strong woman. And they get on very easily. But Annie starts to notice that other people in town sort of treat Sophie a little bit differently. There have been some warnings to Annie about being in a friendship with her. And she also starts to question what Sophie's deal is. So to quote from the inside of the book, which is not a giveaway, it says, Sophie's appearance is uncanny and ageless. Her mansion in the middle of the woods feels a little unearthly. And she does seem to wield a certain power, but she couldn't be, could she? So, what I loved about this book, not only did I enjoy just the core story of it, is this is absolutely a book about a woman who is trying to find herself and who is, again, I feel like this is a theme, which I didn't mean for it to be, but is feeling lost and untethered and not sure what's next and is really just trying to figure out who she is. And I think no matter where you are in your life, there's an element to this that you can relate to. And I talked about this when I talked about Honey Girls by Morgan Rogers. It was that same kind of feeling of really being at a point in your life where you're trying to figure out the what next. And you think you have a plan, you think things are mapped out, you think things are going a certain way. And when all of that changes on you, now what? And who are you without that thing? In Annie's case, it was her ex 
who she was planning to marry and spend the rest of her life with. And who is she without that relationship? And I just loved so much about that core of the story. It's so quotable. I dog-eared, I probably dog-eared more pages than I didn't in this book. Like that's how berserk I went on this one. And I just absolutely loved it. It was so well-written. It was so relatable on so many different levels. And this was gifted to me from Jeannie May, one of my subscribers. So thank you again for gifting this to me. This was high on my list of books to read and I jumped right into it when I got it and I just loved it. So perfect for spooky season, but I would not sleep on it until spooky season. I just thought it was so like, I thought it was gonna sort of be like this witchy creepy vibe and it just wound up hitting home in so many other ways as well. And that's one of the things I loved about it. Next up is a book by an author who has yet to let me down and has reminded me once again why I love her two pieces and it's Wonderland by Jennifer Hillier. So this is the book she wrote right before Jar of Hearts. It has very, I would say Jar of Hearts vibes to it in that same dark, creepy, messy characters, bad choices, just people doing things and I love it. I love it so much. And this one follows a amusement park in a fictional town outside of Seattle. And it has a very sort of creepy vibe to it on a good day because it's got the house of horrors and it's got all the things that are supposed to freak everybody out. And this amusement park in and of itself, so sort of in a very bear townish but not bear townish kind of a way, the entire community revolves around it. This amusement park brings in tourists, it helps to create jobs, like the whole town very much is sustained by this amusement park. So there's a certain air about it, there's a certain protection of it, and there's a certain sweeping under the rug of things about it. To be able to keep it open and up and running and make sure that the town can continue to thrive, thanks to Wonderland. But we know that's not how it's gonna stay. So we have a new sheriff in town named Vanessa. She's a deputy police chief in Seaside and she had been to this town when she was younger. She worked at this amusement park for a summer when she was a teenager. So she has a little bit of history with it, but she winds up leaving Seattle with her daughter and they are trying to start over in this town. So she has a slight connection to it, but not really. She's definitely the outsider. And when our book opens, <laughs> there's a clown museum at this place too. This amusement park sounds just absolutely terrifying to me but it says maybe it's the terrifyingly real house of horrors or maybe it's the dead decaying body left in the midway for all the wonder workers to see. So there is a legit dead body in the middle of Wonderland and Vanessa's gonna find out what happened and she's not gonna take any kind of pressure from anybody else. She's not gonna shut anything down. She's not gonna sweep anything under the rug. She is here to figure it out. I loved this book so much. It's big, I devoured it. I was so into it. I just love her writing. I love her characters. And like I said, I just love like the real messiness of people. And I just think she's absolutely genius. So what I need to do before her new book comes out in the summer is read the three backlist books. So I have Creep, I ordered Freak as my last hurrah of the year, and then I have The Butcher. So I am totally down for it. There's also a character who has appeared in her earlier books who shows up in this one, and that's all you need to know. It's so good, you need to know that too, it's so good. Okay, I have a whole bunch of new to me authors that are definitely going to be authors I will be reading more of in the future. And next up I have Bathhouse by PJ Vernon. So this was another book that I was seeing all over Bookstagram and I was super curious about it. People had arcs of it, they were raving about it. And when it came out, I was like, I need to read this book. Like I just, it sounds so up my alley with the dark and messed up ness of people. So in this one, we follow two characters. We have Oliver and then we have his partner, Nathan. So they had been together for five years. They're not married, but they're as close to being married. And Nathan is a doctor and Oliver is a recovering addict. And when the book opens, Nathan is in New York. So they live, did I say they live in DC? They live outside DC. And Nathan has gone to New York for a convention. And even though Oliver is a recovering addict, he still cannot help but sort of give in to his temptations every once in a while. So in the opening pages of this book, he winds up going to a bathhouse and he just wants to explore it and he wants to meet someone and he knows it's the wrong decision to go and he knows it's not right to be cheating on Nathan, but he just cannot resist it. And he goes to this bathhouse and he barely escapes with his life. 
and what follows is him trying to cover up what he has done, the lies upon lies, they just start stacking and spinning. It's the dynamic between the two of them. It is just sort of this one decision that he has made and how it is going to impact his and Nathan's life going forward and just what a colossal mess of things Oliver has made by making that one decision to go to this bathhouse. This book was super twisty. It was super dark. I definitely was freaked out and creeped out. Like you just didn't know what was coming. I loved how well written this was. There's a lot of emotion to this. There's a lot of secrets. There's a lot of lies. And it's one of those books that it just like keeps ratcheting up the tension and it just keeps going and going. And I just didn't know how it was going to end or where it was going to escalate to. And I just loved it so much. I'm such a fan. Again, went down rabbit holes, podcasts, all the things. I wound up picking up his first book, which I haven't read yet. And I'm excited because he has another one coming out next year. So yes, I picked up Where you, When You Find Me, but I haven't read it yet, but I will be. And I just was so blown away by how much I loved this book and just how much I loved these characters. And it's definitely one of those books where I was rooting for unlikable people. And I just love unlikable characters so much. I don't know what it is about them, but I just, I love when people make bad decisions <laughs> to live with the consequences and seeing how they're going to get out of the mess they've made of things. But I loved this book so much. And yet another book with so much darkness is They Never Learn by Lane Fargo. So I bought this book when it first came out because it was sort of this dark academia serial killer vibe. And then I promptly put it on my shelf which shame on me, but I do believe books find you when they're supposed to find you. I read it this year and loved it, obviously, because here we are talking about it. So this is, we get two different points of view in this book. And out of the gate, we know our main character, Scarlett. So she's an English professor at Gorham University. And every year she searches for the worst men at the school and she murders them. So she's very dextery. She finds the bad men and she takes care of business and she has yet to be caught because she's really, really good at what she does. But this year she's made a little bit of a mistake and the jig might be up. So Scarlett is trying to obviously find her way out of a little bit of a mess that she's gotten herself into. And then we also follow the point of view of a girl named Carly. Carly is a freshman at Gorman and she's trying to escape her old life kind of very much like in the girls are also nice here. She's trying to fit in. She wants to be well liked. She wants to be kind of in the crowd. And then she meets a, I don't know if it's her roommate or just a friend. Nope, it's her roommate, Allison. So it says she's cool and confident. Everything Carly wishes she could be. And the two girls quickly, inform, quickly form an intense friendship. And then Allison is sexually assaulted at a party and Carly is adamant about making the guy pay. So this is very much a tale of revenge. This is very much about people taking matters into their own hands. Again, twists, turns, fabulous female characters in this, great female friendship in this, in some ways dark and messed up. In other ways, like I said, that intensity of being a freshman in college, those relationships that you form. And I just loved everything about this book. I thought it was so smart and well done. I did not know where it was going. I did not know where it was going to end up. I love the dark academia of it all, super atmospheric. And I just love what she did. I thought she just did a stellar job with this story. And I highly, highly recommend it. It's so good. It's got such a great cover to boot. And it's just all the things I want in a book. So that's gonna do it for part two. Thank you guys so much for watching today and hanging out. I will be back with part three in no time because like I said, we are filming this all in one day, just a matter of editing at this stage. But thanks for hanging out. Thanks for spending time with me and I will see you guys in another video really soon. Bye everybody.